All right, so um, Buber, introduction to Buber. I'm gonna put the outline right here for you guys. Um, so number one, we'll talk about a little bit of biography. Then number two, the political context, because that's actually important in this case. And number three, um, uh, existentialism, uh, how should I put it? Um, yeah, existentialist uh, approach, his existentialist approach. So he has a different approach from Kant, who is more of a rationalist. This is a different way of approaching reality. It's a different way of arguing. It's a different way of connecting to truth. And we're going to talk about that, um, if not today, next time. <laughs> okay, so we have about, how long we have? Um, about 50 minutes. Okay, so let me give you a few biographical elements. Uh, so he was born in 1878, and he died in 1965 uh, in Vienna from an Orthodox Jewish family, right? So now we're entering some of the Jewish texts, right? We are going to do two, Buber and Levinas, and then the African, South African one. Uh, good. So he was born in a kind of Orthodox Jewish family, and he actually his grandfather was a renowned scholar of Jewish studies, and he grew up with his grandfather. So he uh, kind of grew up in this atmosphere of, you know, discussions, study, books everywhere, right? That was kind of his background as a child. Um, and so he was pretty much, you know, walking the line, following the path until he became a teenager, right? And this is when everything breaks loose. And he kind of became dissatisfied, right, with his faith around that age. He felt it was too legalistic. It was too, um, uh, not only too legalistic, but um, too isolated, right? I think these are the two criticisms he had of Judaism of his time, was it was too focused on the text, not focused enough on the relationship, right? So in a way, God had become reduced to a text. <laughs> there was not so much talk about a direct connection with God, right? About the possibility of connecting directly, individually, uh, through prayer or meditation. This wasn't emphasized at the time in the kind of Jewish context he grew up in, right? You access God through the text. You would access God by studying. And that's how you would gain. So he, he was dissatisfied with kind of the, 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 the legalism, the dryness, right? Um, the lack of um, emotional uh, connection. Uh, and also he was dissatisfied with the increasing isolated isolation of the Jewish communities, which in a way was justified, right? You had, I mean, anti-Semitism was everywhere <laughs> at the time, especially where uh, towards, right, in Europe and Eastern Europe and so forth, uh, still is, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so, um, so the Jewish communities kind of became more insular, right? They didn't really feel like they had any need to connect or any responsibility to connect with the world and offer something to the world, right? They, they were kind of closed upon them Themselves. And this was another thing that Buber was frustrated with, right? Um, incidentally, I talk about this more in my other classes, but he came back to Judaism through the mystical branch of Judaism called Hasidism, which is kind of a movement that exploded in Eastern Europe in the 19th century um, from a handful of rabbis who actually um, had the same issues with Judaism that Buber had, right? They, they, they were tired of legalism, the, the focus on the text, and they emphasized actually this kind of emotional connection with God, um, the, the ability to connect directly to God, right? Not mediated through study or through collective prayer, right? So, so he actually went back to Judaism later through that, right? Via that, <laughs> that, um, that movement, right? The movement of Hasidism. So, so he actually became pretty uh, involved, actually, in, in, um, in uh, Jewish life. He, I think he did a, a translation of the Bible with Rosenzweig. He also, uh, when he moved to Israel, he started to write a number of essays on Zionism. So this is kind of like his um, Jewish contribution, right? Of course, here we're interested more in the philosophical contribution. So I'm going to go to that now. So, so he breaks with Jewish customs as a teenager and, and starts to study philosophy, right? So he studies uh, Kant, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and you're going to see elements of those, especially Kant, actually. You're going to see a, a very powerful influence of Kant in Buber. So that's why we had to start with Kant. Likewise, in Levinas, we're going to see. Um, 
1896, he, he, he starts his philosophical studies. Uh, 1923, he writes I and Thou, that we're going to read. 1930, he has a teaching position, this time in Germany, in Frankfurt. Um, I mean, all this world is German speaking, so you could move easily from one place to the other. Of course, in 1933, three years later, after getting his position, Hitler comes to power. And uh, he, he actually, um, he resigns um, when Hitler uh, comes to power. And then eventually, anyways, he's forbidden to lecture, right? The, a number of important um, philosophers that we know were actually forbidden to lecture. Jaspers, Husserl, whom we'll talk about with Levinas, all of these, right, were kind of like, you know, duct taped. <laughs> uh, they were not allowed to teach, right? So he actually, disgusted, right, with the climate. He moves in 1938, and that was a smart move. He moves to Jerusalem, right, and that's where he ends up um, as a professor at uh, the University of Jerusalem, right? So that's kind of a little bit of his biography, right? Um, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about the political context that nourished Ayanda, right? Ayanda was written on the backdrop of this political climate that Buber was sensing, even before Hitler came to power, these forces were already at work, and, and which we'll talk about. And they contributed, by the way, right, to the climate in Germany and to what ensued. So let's talk a little bit about what Buber is sensing politically, um, even in the air, right, in the atmosphere, which causes him to write this book and why this book in a way is, is such a powerful prophetic word, right, uh, as well as philosophical, obviously. So we are in the late 19th century and early 20th with Buber and we have a movement, philosophical ideology, which is now taking over most of Europe and this is the movement of materialism, right? This is a movement that emerges also in the British, right? This is the idea that science, in a way, um, uh, uh, that science shows us, right, that there is no spirit, there is only matter. That's, in essence, materialism, right? Materialism says that, you know, all, everything that we thought was, you know, mysterious or spiritual actually is, is, can be explained. Uh, there is a material reason for that. So, for example, you have vision, right? <laughs> Imagine you have a vision. Well, uh, science comes and says, well, you know, that's normal. What happened was uh, you took the substance and the chemical composition altered, and now you had this so-called vision, but actually it's all really matter, right? So we have this rise of matter. There is only the only thing that, it, I mean, this is really a, a movement against Platonism, right? I mean, all of Plato, all the way to Aristotle, to medieval times, you had the opposite what mattered was the realm of spirit, right? And matter, you know, was kind of like this prison of the self that was actually genuinely, essentially spiritual, right? We have now a reversal, right? Spirit doesn't exist. Everything is matter and that's all there is. This is coming from the scientific mindset, right? Which says that everything that exists, the only thing that truly exists is things we can know and understand and see and feel and touch, right? This was the mentality. Right? If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. Um, if I can't touch it, it doesn't exist. So science kind of, the mentality, right? If there is no data, it doesn't have any, it doesn't exist. This is the mentality of science, which is healthy in the context of science, but maybe not so much when applied to philosophy, right? So philosophers are following behind science, right? And they are adopting the same strategy. There is no spirit, only matter, right? So now this, of course, you would think, okay, this is nice. You know, we're getting rid of these old concepts, you know, that mean nothing. And, and to a certain degree, yes, it's, it, there is a certain degree. I mean, it's a housekeeping, right? But there's two, uh, politically, the way it plays out is deeply problematic, right? The way this ideology plays out politically is deeply problematic. So there's actually two main political trends uh, that were taking place during Buber's time. One was socialism and the other one was capitalism. And they were, of course, <laughs> at odds, <laughs> right? The, the whole Soviet Union versus the West, right? So, so he's actually going to show how in both systems, the, it is the ideology of materialism that predominates and that is creating a deep uh, problem, ethical 
metaphysical spiritual problem, right? So, uh, so let's look a little bit at socialism, right? I mean, those of you who come from socialist countries or communist countries, you can probably see and understand more what Buber is gonna be talking about here. So in essence, the, in socialism, right, the collective goal is the most important. And, and the collective goal is usually material prosperity. Right, so make sure you write this down, right? Because the collective goal is not, you know, anything uh, mystical. It's, you know, let's build a better society that, you know, works for everybody and everybody can be happy. So you have this model in China, very well played, right? Collective goal, material prosperity, uh, it's succeeding, right? The, the, there is really a rise of the level. Um, and it is achieved, not individually as for us, right? But collectively. Right. It is believed that, you know, people need to cooperate and there is, you know, the individual in a way needs to respect the collective good. And then, of course, there is this very uh, powerful progress. Right. That, that took place last few years. Right. In China. So you have this. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that the only goal is material prosperity. And because the goal, um, uh, this, this collective goal is the most important, there is a need in a way to make sure there is social cohesion, right? That you can in a way control those masses so that they can work together harmoniously. And the, the agenda in many communist countries is this notion of we control you so that we can work together better. <laughs> if there is everyone thinking something else, we're in trouble. So in many of these communist or socialist countries, you have a kind of, um, a distrust of the metaphysical, right? Because this is in a way enabling people to think above the government, right? If there is anything spiritual going on, that means that you have a higher authority than the government. That means then you start thinking different things and we lose the cohesiveness and the harmony necessary for material progress, right? So the, a lot of the strategies, for example, of the Soviet Union, of China today, is to make sure that people don't have any type of spiritual ideology that would cause them to misbehave, <laughs> right? Uh, so there is a distrust of the spiritual life, uh, of any type of ideology that is not the ideology of the state. And so, for example, in the Soviet Union, uh, during the time of Stalin, which is also close to where Buber is, right, you had a systematic imprisonment of intellectuals, right? If you were a writer or an intellectual, you ended up in the gulags of uh, Siberia, right? Uh, and artists also, right? Artists also suffered under that because they were constantly thinking outside of the box, <laughs> criticizing the system, right? And so anytime you have a voice which is potentially above the collective or that is critical of the collective, this becomes a problem. Why? Because the goal is material prosperity and the means is getting there together, right? So you had uh, many problems in communist Russia, right? Where um, the, uh, the intellectuals, the artists were in a way oppressed, persecuted. Um, you have, I mean, something similar more or less in China. We have the issue of the, the Muslims in China, right? Who are in a way, again, right? They're working according to a higher authority. This is not a... <laughs> This is not acceptable, right? In a country like China, where you are looking for harmonious cooperation, you can't have a bunch of odd, you know, beliefs. Um, so it's similar, right? Um, so it makes sense, right? And and it's 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 all for the sake of this uh, collective prosperity. But Buber is saying in this context, right, when the goal is 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 material prosperity and the means is harmony and homogeneity, you don't have room for the life of the spirit. And it's very true, right? That in many socialist countries, there is no room made, right? For the life of the spirit. And this is where he's saying, we're losing something, right? We're losing something there. Okay, now before we, we think we are, um, you know, um, how, how do we call ourselves? The best country in the world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we have a tendency to think that, you know, those, those savages over there in the Soviet Union and in China, but we have a same, similar problem here in the West, right? And there's also a problem in terms of uh, the rise of materialism in the West. And this is, of course, the same goal. Material is the highest level of prosperity we are imagining, right? When we think, I mean, I, I, I had... Um, I had fun once with the class and I asked them, okay, what's your highest goal? What do you guys want to achieve? Like what's, what's happiness for you, right? And a lot of them were saying, right? 
a good job, a nice house, a family, material, right? If, if, and really, if we look within ourselves, we are part of this society, we will mostly think that the highest level of happiness is financial stability, <laughs> right? And to be happy, right, goes me this entails having certain material security, right? So, and, and of course, our, the way we get there is different, right, from the socialist uh, context, we get there individually, right? So we, in this country, we, the rights that are given people are the rights to achieve individual happiness. So it's not so much, so the goal is the same. It's just the path there is different, but we are essentially the same. That's what Buber is saying. The capitalist countries and the socialist countries are essentially the same. They are, they are eaten by the same plague of materialism. It's just the way you get there that differs, but morally speaking, they have the same problem. Right, and this is nice to hear for once, right? Because we keep on thinking of ourselves as the moral um, light of the universe. <laughs> um, I try not to laugh too hard. Um, yes. Uh, so, okay, yeah, Kong, go ahead. What did you mean to say? <clears throat> oh, not much. I'm just. I mean, I think a lot of working class people don't really imagine like material financial security as happiness per se but just a way to avoid the the misery of of poverty or the opposite yeah absolutely right so of, of course you need a basis right but the issue what Buber is saying is that for there's no uh, and we're gonna see right uh, just like there's no room in socialist countries for the spiritual life here too i haven't said it yet but here too and then we're going to see the issue here too there is something missing right so let me go further so you can understand and then i'll get you coco <laughs> when i'm done uh with that particular idea so the, the the problem here is not so much that we're looking to be comfortable and i mean the material part is okay obviously we should be comfortable right but it's when there is only the material that's the problem and this is the case here too let me explain yes we have individual freedoms Yes, we have, you know, free speech. Yes, we have freedom of religion. So then we think we're very spiritual as a country, but actually what Buber is saying, yeah, we have that, but we are losing something that they have, which is connection, right? We are, we are losing the capacity in this country to relate to each other, right? So everything is individual. Everything is me, right? And whatever happens to you doesn't affect me. I don't feel responsible for this guy or that guy or this neighborhood or this state, right? And this is where we are becoming deeply impoverished because the life of the spirit for Buber is not just individual freedom of thought and speech. The life of the spirit occurs between us. Make sure you write this down because we'll come back to this, right? The spirit is not something within that I can cultivate by reading books, right? And by saying what I think, right? This is not the life of the spirit. The life of the spirit is intersubjective. It's relational. And we'll see more of that as we study Buber, right? So even though we have freedom of speech and we have, you know, um, freedom of religion and we can say what we want, paint what we want, compose what we want. And so we feel like we're a very spiritual nation, according to Buber, we are missing something which those nations have like china and, and and soviet union russia now right we are lacking the basis the basics of human connection our civilization is more and more turned into the isolated individual right in fact when you think about uh, just the way uh, our country the 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 line in our i think it's in the declaration of independence or in the constitution right that every uh, human being is entitled to life uh, uh happiness hold on like <laughs> what is it uh, <laughs> liberty <laughs> thank you and the pursuit of happiness right uh when we think of this we are not thinking of this goal as a collective goal we are thinking of it that the state is there not to produce this for everybody this is not our goal as a country the state is there to make sure that individuals are able to achieve this if they choose to so the state is not there to ensure that all of us get there, that's not the role. The state, at least the, when this was written, when this document was written, the state is simply there to ensure that nobody impedes on my right for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So in this, so, so make sure you write this down because this is so important. 
if the goal of this document is to protect the individual, then the other is always going to be perceived as a potential threat. And this is the problem of Western societies. The rights are always the rights of the individual. They're never the rights of the community or the rights of the other, right? It's always the rights of the individual. If it's only, and the state is there to protect the rights of the, the individual, from who? From the other. So the other is always considered as a potential threat to my rights. In, in that context, I am constantly pushing off the other. And that's where we have this sense of isolation in our communities because our, we know that we can only become successful when we push others away. This is how we become successful. This is our model of success, competition. I win if you lose, <laughs> right? In such a context where I win if you lose, right? We are lacking. Uh, this, the spiritual life is absent, right? Okay, so now let's get some questions. So there was Coco and maybe a few more questions and comments and dissents. <laughs> I'm listening. Pass. Pass, Coco. Pass. Pass. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Oh. Okay, Cosmides, go ahead. <clears throat> I just had a question. You were saying um, the the life of the spirit is relational. It's within us. Can you just go over that one more time? Just yeah. Well, of course, bit. we'll go much more deeply in that. But the idea for Buber is this whole the realm of the metaphysical right which philosophers talk about everywhere right plato kant and so forth and plato believes the realm of the metaphysical or transcendence or of the spiritual is somewhere in the heaven or it's not that's not true it's 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 beyond the material and it's guiding right how how the material works and kant we saw that with morality right but he's going to say actually the realm of the metaphysical is between people so he makes ethics the path to metaphysics, which is not something that Plato would do. Kant may be, but Plato, remember, metaphysics is at the detriment of ethics. If you've read the symposium and you saw the discourse of Socrates, where he says, well, what matters is beauty in itself, and we fall in love with beautiful people, but eventually we have to discard those people so we can just love beauty or wisdom, right? So Plato, uh, ethics is what you have to shed <laughs> in order to have a direct contact with wisdom, beauty, truth, right? Now, what, what Buber is doing is he's transposing the metaphysical realm to the ethical level. So it's as we interact as individuals that we connect to the metaphysical realm, this, this deeper dimension, right, that is beyond the physical. Um, am I making some sense, Cosmides? This is an important question, what she asked. This, this yeah. This is telling us something about what Buber is doing and living us too, by the way, same movement. Now Kant kind of does it, right? When he says that um, reason, right? Uh, what is our, the, the, the highest part of us, the moral part of us, the noumenal part of us is interested in the dignity of the other human being. It's also a moral. We access the noumenal part of us um, through ethics for Kant. So Kant is part of this, even though he sounds very different, right? So make sure you write this down, right? That for Buber, the metaphysical, which people like uh, Plato and people like Heidegger situate outside of the physical, right? Uh, I mean, all through the Middle Ages, right? Uh, all the way to Heidegger, they situate the, the metaphysical. This is a realm that we can connect to individually right? Descartes, everybody, right? Now comes somebody like, like Husserl and, and uh, Buber and Levinas, they're actually going to say, no, this deeper dimension of our being, the noumenal, the mystery, the eternal, these are all words that philosophers have given this dimension. It occurs between us, right? And this is where Buber is fascinating, right? Making a very powerful move here. So in our society where the interconnectivity is uh, slowly unraveling, dissolving, disintegrating, we are losing the life of the spirit. No matter how many books we read, how many religious services we go to, how many ideas we spout, <laughs> right? We are still becoming more and more impoverished spiritually because the, the, the social fabric is disintegrating. Uh, okay, there was another question which disappeared. <laughs> 
where to go. Uh, why is she? Um, ask your question. <laughs> Why is she, where are you? It's just between interpersonal interactions. Yeah, exactly. So even right, uh, he, uh, both him and Levinas will say the same thing. God is found between us. That's the, the okay. that you have formulated religiously, right? Or yeah, he, and he, he wants to let go of all the materialism, which is putting like this blockage between us like as people like because in the west we are isolating ourselves we're more inclined to think about oh i need to have my property i need to have my my um cash i have to have my job this and that and whoever i need to help i don't really want to help them because it won't benefit me right that's the idea and so even though we're free we're free to think and free to compose Right? And we think we're spiritual beings because of that, we are not, right? We have lost the, the true life of the spirit, which is not intellectual or aesthetic. It's relational, it's ethical. That's the true life of the spirit. That's the true contact with the metaphysical. Um, so, okay. yes, uh, yeah, sorry, why is she? No, 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 that was like, okay. So Thank we, you. Yeah, to see the power of this move, we have to remember through the history of philosophy how metaphysics were described, right? Plato, metaphysics is something you achieve by shedding the material, right? You want to focus, have the direct intuition of the ideas, and you have to shed uh, your material, you have to come out of the cave, right? And you have to shed uh, in many ways what makes you uh, a, matter, a material human being. Uh, then you have, of course, the Middle Ages, which are religious, so it's always God. <laughs> and then you have, right, um, somebody, now Kant is starting to move in that direction, right? But you do have a tradition in the West of considering that the metaphysical can be accessed in solitude, right? Somebody like Descartes, who wants to find truth by himself. He argues for the existence of God in his little log cabin in the middle of winter by himself, right? Uh, Heidegger, the concept of being, right? This is something that I become aware, right? When I, uh, when I sense in my own experience, uh, the approach of death by myself, right? I don't need other people to have this deep connection with being, right? Uh, likewise for Descartes, I don't need other people to have this deep connection with truth. And this has been a problem, which Levinas will talk about, right? This kind of vertical connection with the metaphysical, which became a problem during the Nazi era, which we'll talk about with Levinas, right? So what Buber is doing is saying, no, the true metaphysics, true contact with the absolute, true contact with transcendence is between us. It's not by yourself, you know, thinking about, you know, the realm of ideas or the concept of being. Uh, Cosmidis, go ahead. <laughs> Was it Levinas who said that, like, we are the, like, the, the arms and legs, like the hands and feet of God? Who was that that said that? Simone Veil. <laughs> Simone Veil, yeah. Is that kind of similar to that? That like we are like between us, like the way that we act and treat each other, that's like we are God and like the spiritual and stuff? She's also transposing to the horizontal. After World War II, it became obscene to believe in God without any... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, that was that, it, was, it was that part. Yeah, I remember that uh, because that was a problem, right? The Nazis uh, were very metaphysical beings. They were artists, they were poets, they were musicians, they were philosophers, right? So they were very spiritual beings, right? And that's why many philosophers after the war shifted, right? True metaphysics is not by yourself vertical because you can still be a murderous tyrant and that therefore not truly spiritual, right? So, so Buber, Levinas, Kant also, even before, right? He senses that it occurs between us, right? So now we have, uh, this is a very important concept that we understand now because that's where we're headed for the rest of the semester, right? We have to stop thinking of metaphysics as something up there that we connect to through, you know, um, you know, intellectually or, or, and so forth, right? We connect to it ethically through, we'll see with Buber and Levinas, embodied action. That's how you connect. We'll talk more about that. Okay, any other questions before I continue? Um, okay, 
All right, so you can hopefully see by now, right, how both systems, right, whether it's the communist or socialist or capitalist, right, are suffering from the same pathology, which is this kind of material goal, right, the materialistic goal uh, and, and the dissolution of the life of the spirit, right? So in the, in the communist context, the dissolution is on the level of the individual, right? The individual in a way is merged with the collective. This is a problem. And we see that, right? But what we don't see is how we are also suffering from similar pathology because we are um, in a way losing the life of uh, connections. We're losing the relational life, which is the only place where the metaphysical takes place. Okay, all right. So Buber, of course, is gonna, uh, I'll give you a few terminology, right? He's gonna say, in a way, so there are three concepts that he'll talk about, the I, it, the I, I, and the I, thou, right? So these are ways of relating, right? These are, um, so what he's going to say is that predominantly we look at the world and we relate to the world, including people, in what he calls an I, it relationship. In other words, there is the I and everything else is an it that I can use or dispose of according to my uh, to what works for me, right? So we can see this widespread, right? Uh, I it, yes, I think I wrote it, I it. Oops, sorry, sorry, yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, oh, I'm really, get, can't do this. Okay, here we go, I it, <laughs> thank you, Kim. Right, uh, very good, right, I it. So in other words, what, he, what Buber is remarking now, I'm, I'm going a little deeper, right, into the problem, is that we are both, in both contexts, in both systems, we are relating to each other and to the world as an it, as an object. In other words, people have become mere objects that I use or discard at will. And this can happen collectively or individually. Collectively, you have this issue of workers being exploited for the sake of the company. The workers don't matter. They're this, this the world, uh, the, what do you call it when you can replace someone? Disposable, Disposable right? The workers are disposable. The workers, uh, the pay is not important. What matters is that they just do the work and, 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 you know, bring profit to the company and then we're good. Yes. Thank you, Coco. Cogs in the machine, right? Absolutely. So we have this mentality, right? Everywhere. <laughs> this is everywhere. This is China, Russia, United States, Europe. We are all doing this right now, right? We are all, um, in a way, people are being, uh, throughout right throughout our economic uh, system in the whole world you have this notion of people as a means that we can use to make the company or the you know the, the handful of shareholders a profit right so this notion of profit so we have this I mean you have this also to a certain degree in the political level where people are just um, Although that would be more, so let me leave it at the economic. <laughs> okay, so, so you have this on the, on the economic level, but you also have this on the individual level, right? How many of us have not right, befriended someone uh, because we were interested in something they could get us, right? Or how many of us have not ghosted someone out of the blue? Or how many of us, right? We have a tendency, right? We, we, uh, we meet some people and then when it doesn't work, or we date some people and when it doesn't work, you know, we kind of throw them away, <laughs> right? We do this, I mean, it's second nature, right? You will ghost someone and not think anything about it, <laughs> right? You've just discarded them uh, like an object, right? So our relationships, Buber is saying, not just collectively, but individually, we are losing the capacity to relate with human beings as human beings and not as objects that we can use or discard, right? Cause me this. I mean, like, we've been taught that, though. We've been taught, like, that that's how to become successful, that, oh, the only reason these people are successful are because of the connections that they make. Your life is all about the connections you make. Go to university to make connections, to get a job. So you hear that in your whole life, that, be, like, oh, ne like, never, like, close, like, never have a bad connection, like, connection with somebody because you never know who they're going to be one day, and you might need a job from them, or you might need this. Like, yeah, networking, it's, 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 you, that's what we're taught to do so we're taught that like oh this person looks like they're kind of going somewhere let me go become their friend it's just <laughs> exactly. because we need to like up ourselves in order to succeed in this country 
Exactly, exactly. So you see how pervasive it is, right? I mean, even dating right now is like, you know, you put, you, you, you have this, you swipe, <laughs> like you go shopping, like you're on Amazon, you know, put someone in little carts, right? Go off with them in the, in the night. So that's the idea, right? We are really, we are really taught like that. Even when you go to your therapist, right? And you're in a difficult relationship and the therapist will tell you, uh, what's this expression they say? Uh, what is this person? How do they say it? Uh, let me try to remember my last meeting with a therapist. Um, she told me. Uh, is it what does this person have to offer you? Yeah, what do they offer you? What's it? What's in it for you? What are you gaining from this? Right. It's it's entirely focused on the self. Right. What What did she say? She said so it was. Uh, it stuck with me. It bothered me. <laughs> it was like, what are you? something like that how is this relationship working for you or something like what are you getting out of it right um so they will also right even the therapy is focused on the self and not so much on the couple right it's focused on the individual and in a way you will be advised even by your therapist well you know how do they say you uh, we say often i have outgrown this relationship or this relationship is not working for me anymore why is a relationship supposed to work for us when did we get this idea that the relationship is supposed to be working for us right um how, how when did we forget that we are supposed to be putting in the work <laughs> for the relationship so we have even right on the very interpersonal level a very egotistic approach even your therapist will encourage you to think about you right now it's not bad to think about you obviously if you're not there there's no relationship but what i'm saying is that very often right we are taught to to think as individuals and not as a couple or as a collectivity right i don't see therapists asking us to think as a couple right um this is this is rare so that's the idea right this is really kind of so the i it right is is pervasive that's what um buber is noticing Kang, go ahead Kang. um yeah i was just gonna say that kind of a flip side to it a related note is that we're taught to kind of view any calls to self-sacrifice with a lot of suspicion um like one example is churches asking you to Think of what you can provide to the church and not what the church can provide you we would say oh that's just religious um yes um, or like patriotism asking citizens to sacrifice for their country we would say that's propaganda um and yeah in couples too we would say oh they're just using me then if i have to sacrifice for the relationship i i like very much what you're saying the word sacrifice is a bad word in our civilization right we just can't hear it because we hear sacrifice and we hear victim, we hear weakness, we hear abuse, right? Uh, when we get to Levinas, he actually mentions, he talks about sacrifice and he emphasizes, right? That there can be no relationship without sacrifice. And he talks about the structure of the relationship, he says, is sacrifice, <laughs> right? So we're gonna talk about that, right? So, and, and yeah, this is part of our issue, we don't know we do not accept right uh the concept or the experience of sacrifice right we have rejected this as part maybe of our rejection of religion as a whole but not only right because this this predates religion right so yeah we're gonna so buber not going to talk about sacrifice but Levinas is going to go there <laughs> right uh very good uh Kong. I, I like that observation um ethics of love oh yes <laughs> uh, cosmides yes we are uh, there should be connections between this class and the ethics of love class that i'm teaching uh very good okay so um so the i it right now there's the other uh, play which is the i i <laughs> uh for buber and the i i for buber the plague there is it's not that so much that you're using someone or discarding someone is that you are entirely enveloped in your own life <laughs> there's only you so you're not even selfish because to be selfish implies another human being right you're completely self-sufficient right and you don't even need other people to walk on to to get somewhere and this is another plague of our civilization is the solitude right the the, the autonomy that we are capable of achieving in in the, in the west it is possible to live your whole life alone right uh, and not need another human being. We've gotten to that point where we don't really need 
as in other societies, the support, right, of family and, and community and so forth. So we are also in this other plague of, right, autonomy, uh, self-reliance, and so solitary, so solitude, solitariness, okay? <laughs> solitude, <laughs> right, isolation, fragmentation, right? So this is not just the fragmentation uh, of, of, right, we don't have a sense of the other, it's just now we are just little pieces floating around by ourselves, right? Or our family unit is doing so. So this is another part, right? Where we are, in a way, living through life without experiencing genuine connections. Now, you can have a bunch of friends and be in the I, I, right? You can have a bunch of friends, you can have a lot of people around you, but you have never really had a relationship which really lasted, right? You've broken up with your parents, with your family. You have like one, one, one romantic partner every three months, right? This is the I, I. <laughs> There's no evil intent. It's just you are in a way finding it superfluous to have any lasting relationships, right? And a lot of us are struggling with that too, right? We are finding ourselves incapable of sustaining relationships, right? We are locked in this kind of uh, I, I. Um, and, and we are again, right, missing the life of the spirit, right? Even if it can be a monk, very spiritual, <laughs> right? If you're locked in the I, I, you do not taste the true life of the spirit. And so Buber is going to propose to us a, a third path, which is the I, thou, right? Or the I, you, depending on the translation, right? I usually say I, thou. So the Aida now is what he wants to teach us and what we will be studying in the text, right? This is a completely different, this is a way of relating where you are connecting now with a genuine human being. And what is the nature of that relationship? What is the dynamic? How, what does it entail? And that's what we'll be studying. What, what Buber wants us to remember is how to relate in that way. Uh, good, we have a couple questions. So Kang and Cosmidis, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I forgot to put my hands out. Cosmidis? I'm sorry, I keep like giving examples and like bringing things up that I like thinking of, but the I-I relationship where it's like, um, what was it just now? It was like the, I don't need anyone, you know, like I can do it all by myself that's like very prevalent right now I think and I think that people don't do it right in a way of like the like self-care is a thing where it's like what doesn't serve you is this person toxic in your life cut them out this like they're toxic like get rid of them canceled like buy sweaty like this whole situation where it's like whatever makes you happy and whatever serves you but what if doing all those things doesn't actually serve you because you're not actually learning how to communicate or be a kind person or be a good person. You're just feeling like I do so much and you don't do anything for me Bye. and it's like, well, what if the other person feels like you're lacking and they just haven't said anything and there's no room for conversation. There's no room for growth. A lot of the times people just kind of like give up or they just like, I'm over it. I'm not like in it. There's like, a, it's just about dropping people and canceling people. I'm leaving you behind. Like, I don't know, people give up on people really easily without accommodating for differences and for disagreements and things. It's like, it's like an echo chamber as well in a sense of like self care and like, you're not good for me, bye. And it's like, you can't accept anyone that's slightly different or telling you something that maybe you don't wanna hear. I don't know. Yeah, no, thank you, lovely. Thank you for summarizing very well what I'm trying to say with the I, I. absolutely. Whatever Cosmides said, that's it, right? Uh, the way we cancel each other, the way, and I love the way you found the thing the therapist said, um, how is, um, is this relationship serving you? This is what they will tell you, the highest authority, right? The, the, the therapist, is this relationship serving you? And we forget to go back to Kong's point, right? How are you serving the other in this relation? How are you, what acts of service are you bringing to the relationship, right? It's not about the relationship serving us, right? So we are in this context where we are just, I, I, I don't need anything that bothers my you know, self-care bubble, <laughs> right? I, let me take away all of these toxic influences, i.e. other people, <laughs> right? So that I can, you know, uh, and this is really the I, I, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Cosmetis. Um, there's a couple more. King and Coco, go ahead. 
So uh, I, th I think what's happening is that there was a pendulum uh, shifting away from the interconnectedness of the early um, uh, 2000, well, late 2000, uh, the early, okay, so the early 2020 era, no, no, but let's say 2010, right? That era where, um, where Facebook was um, on the rise and the biggest uh, social networking platform and everybody was interconnected in that way. And I think from that era, um, the pendulum is swinging away from it where you want to be less connected and you want to escape that. And a lot of trends say that um, loneliness, well, the, the sensation of loneliness is on a rise where people feel more lonely. And, you know, we could see, well, well actually, I, I, can't, I can't speak for the data, but I, I feel as if um, depression is, is um, growing up and loneliness and feeling um, less, less interconnected because it was a movement that we wanted to, to steer towards and now we're getting it. Yeah, very good. So you're summarizing very well, right? The climate of the time, um, this kind of solitude and the depression that is coming from being disconnected. This is the, uh, the rise of the I, I, right? So not only we're in the I, it, right? Where we exploit, use and discard each other, right? We're also very in this kind of bubble, right? We're growing this bubble around us. Thank you. Very good um, uh, uh, description, uh, King. Uh, Coco. Yeah, okay, this is going to be annoying, but I feel like you guys are really strawmanning the, the self-care thing, because I'm, I'm sorry, but like, mm -hmm. there, are there are some people, like, people have lines that you do not cross, and if you tell them, please don't cross this line, please don't cross this line, please don't cross this line, and they keep crossing it. <laughs> What do you, would you different. Prefer? That's not what I'm arguing. I'm arguing for people that will like not. Oh, of course. Care. But the problem is when you say self, describe that as self care. That's not what people will say. But what I was saying was that people are doing self care wrong because people like are trying to be like self care, cut out toxic people, and they think and some people think that that means drop people and don't have conversations and just like you don't care. But what that really means is like if you have conversations with somebody and it's bringing in what you've done wrong and what they've done wrong and speaking to each other and going through it, that's different. But a lot of people just don't even look at themselves in the situation and don't look at the situation as a whole and they'll just like drop it. I know I didn't like go into it that much, but that's kind of what I meant when I say people do it wrong. Okay, fair enough. Cause yeah. I'm like, okay, we gotta, I just want to at least define the lines very clearly here. Cause there's a difference between, yeah. yeah. There's a difference between, you know, cutting, cutting people off that like, will continue to disrespect you no matter, like, in regardless of how much you talk, communicate, if they keep doing it at that point, you know, if they keep disrespecting the boundary that you set. Yeah, sorry, I just really, I, I don't want the, uh, the class to end with the whole, like, with the mentality of cutting people off, never. No, 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 if someone, there's a line, sometimes you have to draw it, you gotta draw it, I, sometimes. Not so, always, don't make it so defined, don't make it so rigid, but there's lines. Very good, Coco. Yeah, we're going to obviously write the I is present in the IU, which we're about to go into, right? So, um, so you're right, right? If, if we're going to, what, 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 the, what Buber and Levinas later on are talking about when they talk about sacrifice, when they talk about, right, this, this kind of um, relation, which is not an it or an I, the, 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 the element of sacrifice is not to be identified with victimhood. And we're going to talk about that right? We have to talk about that. It's different to be sacrificial than to be a victim. A victim, there are no boundaries, you're constantly taken over and so forth. The act of sacrifice, however, is an act of, it's, it's an act of the will. The I is very powerfully present in the sacrificial act, right? And of course, this, these are difficult ideas. Uh, we're gonna, especially for our civilization, right? We're taught to draw Right, like you're saying, Coco, you're describing very well how all of us think. Yeah, these are my boundaries. If you cross them another time, we're done. <laughs> right? Um, but we, according to Buber and Levinas, right, two things, right? On the one hand, if we discard uh, too quickly, we miss uh, something from the relationship. And number two, you can be sacrificial without being a victim. And we'll have to go into that as we get into Levinas. So make sure you guys already start thinking about how one can be sacrificial without being a victim because this is fundamental to understand someone like Levinas. So the I is very powerful in the act of sacrifice. 
very good boundaries, right? Uh, am I kind of starting to make sense, Coco? I shouldn't make too much sense because we didn't do Levinas, but are you seeing kind of where I'm going, Coco? Um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I was just thinking back to my own personal experience with a, one particular person. Like I, I had know, to. I know, Coco. And I'm like, mm, no, no. I, I don't regret that one. That one, I can't. <laughs> I, I regret. Like, I regret sometimes pushing people because you know, I, that sometimes I do regret. But no, there's sometimes I'm like, no, I made the right call. <laughs> We've been talking about this for semesters long. <laughs> yeah, like there's some. Um, mm, no, there's there's lines, man. Like, Very good, Coco. No, it's good. Excellent. Any other uh, reactions <laughs> to what we're talking about? Okay, now the INU, of course, I'll just give you a few pointers. We'll, we'll go into it uh, very deeply. Uh, let me see where exactly. I think we should go into it before we get to the last section. Um, yeah, we should probably talk about it um, next time. Um, yeah, so the IU, uh, yeah, the IU and the IDAO is the same thing as just me using two different translations, <laughs> right? So the IDAO or the IU <laughs> is, of course, he's going to go along the lines of Kant, right? Um, in, to begin with, but he's going to go much deeper, right? Kant also talks about the IU, this way of relating which respects the, the dignity of a human being, right? This is the act of respect. Right, so Buber is going to follow this line of thought. He's going to talk about a way of relating that respects the dignity of the human being, but he's going to go way beyond Kant, and he's going to tell us different. Uh, 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 he's going to really develop what it does it mean, the human being, and how does one genuinely relate to a human being in a way that honors their humanity. And this goes way beyond just the respect. There's a lot more going on, right? Which we'll talk about uh, next time when I when I look at the uh, when I introduce uh, his uh, philosophical method, right? Okay, um, good. So um, what I'm gonna do next time uh, is is to uh, give you. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, so maybe I can uh, start a little bit. Um, no, let me keep it for next time. Next time, what I'm going to go into, and this is something I was prompted to do by my ex-class, <laughs> the last class I taught this in. Um, they, they were not able to see, and I hadn't explained, <laughs> uh, how Buber is speaking as a philosopher, right? When you start to read Buber, and you'll see right away, uh, you, you already have to read a passage for next time, you're going to see that he writes more like a poet, right? There's no argument. It's very... Uh, kind of hermetic, meaning he, he writes in a kind of obscure way. It's very, you don't know what he means. He's not trying to be clear. Uh, he's also, it's very metaphorical. It's very enigmatic, right? So he's kind of writing in enigmas and you kind of, and, and he invents words and concepts. <laughs> so, and there's no moment in Buber where he sits down and makes an argument for what he's saying. Right. And so many of the people that I taught, the students that I taught last time were like, well, he's not a philosopher. He's just uh, he's he's a theologian. Right. He's just talking about things that he assumes exist. Right. So that's why I need to have a, a, a special moment next time to introduce a little bit his philosophical method. And we need to go into detail as to how he argues. How is he what is his philosophical approach? right? Uh, how is he still a philosopher, right? So, so I, I'm not going to explain it yet because I want you to enter the text with pure eyes, right? With pure hearts and really get hit by the kind of richness and uh, wildness of his writing. And then we'll go together and, and see what is the underlying method that he's using so that we can see how he is still writing as a philosopher and not just as a mystic or a prophet, right? Um, good. So, um, all right. Um, so, so let's see, I'm trying to see if I should have like six minutes. I could technically, what do you guys want me to do? <laughs> should I start what I'm going to say next time or should we just give it a, like, call it a day? How, those of you who want me to start, can you start? Can you a day? Okay. So hand in the screen if you want me to start. Oh, I see a wonderful enthusiasm for <laughs> one person. Tessie Miller, okay. Well, no, actually, I had a question. Oh. 
<laughs> this class is unredeemable. Okay, this is Mila. Go ahead, ask your question. It was, it was in regard, I don't know if you mentioned this already, but the syllabus, because I know you said you wanted to do group work before the exams. So now when is the next group work before the Uber so exam? Think, uh, didn't I put the, the new syllabus um, on Blackboard? It is, is up there, did I not see it? I, yeah, I just changed it a couple of days ago. And the group work is always right before the exam. So like this, it's usually a Tuesday. Tuesday, what am I saying? Are we, yeah, 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 wait, we're Wednesday. It's usually a Monday. So we'll have three sessions of Boober and then the group work and then the exam. So I changed this. Normally it should be the new syllabus. Did anybody see the new syllabus? Uh, okay, Pari. Uh, okay, Pari. Um, Good, okay. It's um, on there. You see it, right? The changes. Okay. Montes, you have a question. And then Kim. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually about the syllabus. Um, so I was just looking at the syllabus and it was saying that the I and thou reading is due a week from today, next Wednesday. And we have a uh, class on Tuesday uh, next week just because um, like that's the way the schedule is so oh yeah I don't do those yeah those those Monday Tuesday schedules uh, I don't think I took into account I just teach the regular days so 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 is the, re the reading assignment just due next Wednesday not next Tuesday yeah no class uh, okay. because we never have class on Tuesday so I just <laughs> I can't keep track of those weird schedules so uh, so we're always on the regular days and uh, if uh, the syllabus usually is the Bible so you just follow the syllabus if if it's wrong then it's 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 my fault <laughs> okay. no problem thank you if it says nothing for Tuesday there is nothing you have a vacation <laughs> I think there was another question by uh, oh I see Kim go ahead Kim hi professor um, I see what Francesca is saying on the new syllabus it says that the second group work is going to be October 14th, but, the, but October 10th is when the test is due? No. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, let me pull up my syllabus. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Oh, I can't minimize it when I'm recording? Great. Um, how do I do that? How do I get to my syllabus? Ah! Okay. I'm almost there. Okay, syllabus 144. Okay. No, it says October 17. I changed it. I have October 17. Um, maybe you have a earlier syllabus, no? Who has the syllabus where it says October 17? Right, I'm sorry. I'm so, I, just, I just pulled up a new one. I apologize. Oh, okay, so we're good. Yes, yes, so all is good. Thank you for checking. Yes, it's, I sometimes make mistakes, so. Okay, great. All right. Any other questions? We have three minutes. <laughs> um, all right, great. Good. Um, so I'll let you enter Boober best you can. Uh, you have a reading assignment due when's the next time we meet? Uh, uh, Wednesday, right? Next Wednesday. So you have some time. Uh, try to read the whole book since you have time. And uh, it's always better that way. Uh, let's see. Uh, Allegra, you have a question? I have a question. Oh, oh go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, it's regarding the box. Uh, I know I emailed you regarding the box in the bookstore, but and you said we need seven books, but there's only like four books in the bookstore. <laughs> yes, uh, I thought you were in another class. I'm realizing that now. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so we just need the four books then, yeah? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's all right. Thank you. Good. Uh, let's see. Okay, guys, if you have private, okay, let me stop the recording.